Sinema and congressional Republicans at a time when the economy was quite weak and the feeling was that the uh, economy couldn't take an increase in taxes at a time of... And all of that at cspan.org slash fiscal cliff. The U.S. House is gaveling in next for legislative work. Eight bills on the, on the agenda this afternoon. No votes expected. Will be taken later. What purpose does the gentleman from California rise? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 6604. Clerk will report the bill. H.R. 6604, a bill to designate the federal building currently known as Federal Office Building 8, located at 200 C Street Southwest in the District of Columbia, as the Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr. Federal Building. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from California, Mr. Denham, and the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, Ms. Capiano, will each control 20 minutes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on H.R. 6604. Without objection. Without objection. So ordered. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I'd like to uh, thank the majority for bringing this bill up. This is a, a, a nice way to honor the longest serving, continuously serving speaker in the history of this country. And for those of you who didn't have the pleasure of knowing Mr. O'Neill, I'd just like to remind everybody that not just, I don't look at him as the historic figure up on the podium. I look at him as a man that I, that I knew a fair amount of my adult life anyway as a man who never forgot where he came from. And I know that's in a phrase that people hear all the time. And for me personally, when people say that of me, it's probably the nicest thing they can say about me. Uh, everyone who serves in Congress knows that many of us on a regular basis get treated like some, something special. Somebody opens the door for us. Somebody calls us congressman. People we don't know call us sir. And that's all well and good. And it's respectful for the office. But at the same time, we all came here for the very simple reason of trying to make the world a little better place for the people that elected us. It's a simple thing, and we all have different views on how that gets done. Mr. O'Neill never forgot how to do that, even when he re reached the pinnacle of power in this great body. And I will tell you that for me, that's the most important historic aspect he could ever leave for us. All the great accomplishments, all the meetings with presidents and kings and queens, very important. I don't want to diminish them. But at the end of the day, if you've forgotten who you represent, that I think you've stayed here too long. Mr. O'Neill never did. I knew him even after he retired. And even then, he would talk to me about regular, ordinary people, the barbers, the bakers, the truck drivers that I now have the privilege of representing in the district that he once represented. And to me, that's the most important reason to recognize anyone. Someone who gave of themselves to fight day in and day out. And with that, even then, with all the fighting that we do around here, it's amazing to me, even today, with all the differences of opinion we have, I get the same questions I'm sure we all get. Well, geez, is it really as bad as all that, and do you hate each other? And, and the truth is, for me, no. I, I, you know, I have the speaker sitting over there. We disagree on probably most every major point. But I like him. I think he's a good man. And I think he's here for the exact same reasons that I'm here, to make this country a better place to live. And I think that way about virtually everyone in this body. And Speaker O'Neill not only represented that, he spoke it loudly all the time. He loved this body, not for all the difficulties that it presents, not for all the messes that we create and then try to fix, but for the fact that we have a lot of people who come here trying to work on the most difficult issues in the world with passion and with commitment and with respect for each other. And with that, I, I, will, I, will, yield the, I will reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from California. Thank you. I wish to yield one minute to the Speaker of the House, the Honorable John Boehner. Chair recognizes the Speaker. Well, let me thank my colleague uh, uh, for yielding, and uh, I rise in strong support of H.R. 6604, and uh, commend uh, my colleague, the gentle aide from California, Ms. Pelosi, uh, for uh, sponsoring this resolution. You know, Tip O'Neill needs no introduction to this body. Every member knows, uh, respects, and admires Tip's record and his long shadow that he cast over the people's house. Uh, we've all borrowed perhaps his best known saying, all politics is local. Uh, it's certainly true today, uh, as we pro propose to name a building 
right here at the foot of Capitol Hill, a stone's throw from this great dome in honor of our 55th speaker. Uh, this is one of those moments uh, when you wonder uh, how the honoree would feel, especially when it's someone like Tip uh, who never quite held back his opinions. Uh, perhaps uh, he would have enjoyed seeing leaders from opposite sides of the aisle come together to give him a well-deserved hurrah. Uh, certainly, uh, he, he would have gotten a kick out of being flanked uh, by buildings named after Hubert Humphrey and Jerry Ford, uh, also leaders from opposite ends of the political spectrum. Now, Tip actually considered uh, Mr. Humphrey one of his heroes, and uh, he had one of uh, Humphrey's quotes uh, put up on the wall in his office. Now, as for Jerry Ford, uh, well, they didn't frankly agree on much of anything. Uh, but Tip counted President Ford as a true friend. And since friends are always honest with one another, with one another when the, the new president uh, would explain what legislation he wanted to pass, Tip would say, well, Jerry, that's not going anywhere. But sure, send it over anyway if that's what you want to do. Uh, that was Tip. And uh, who, of course, would also be pleased to see us down here telling an old story or two. Uh, now he'll stand in good company and, ever the representative, uh, provide the folks back home with yet another source of pride. Having said all that, uh, Tip might have had one small complaint about today's occasion. Uh, a proud partisan, Tip relished nothing more than a close vote, one that would give him a chance uh, to do uh, just a last bit of a, uh, a little more wrangling uh, as uh, he tried to secure the vote. Today, when the roll is called on this bill, however, uh, the outcome is likely to be unanimous, a reflection of this body's vast gratitude and appreciation uh, for the gentleman from Cambridge. So I would urge the whole House uh, to join me in supporting this resolution, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Denham. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Massachusetts. I'd like to yield one minute to the once and future Speaker of, of this House, the current Minority Leader, Ms. Pelosi. Chair, recognize the Minority Leader. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I thank Speaker Boehner for his leadership and cooperation in bringing this legislation to the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, Tip O'Neill said the Speaker of the House was Millie, his wife, and uh, I had the privilege of serving in the office uh, that Tip O'Neill had when he was Speaker of the House and having in my possession the, uh, the gavel that, that uh, was given to Speaker O'Neill when he became uh, the leader, not yet the Speaker, and it, it's Waterford, Mr. Speaker, so you could only use it one time. <laughs> and uh, perhaps you would use it today, but uh, you made this possible. All of us who admire and love Tip O'Neill are grateful to you for that, so I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and for your very fine words. Two weeks ago, members of Congress uh, joined members of the O'Neill family and many others to plant a tree in honor of the life of Speaker Tip O'Neill. Today, we honor Tip again by passing a resolution to inscribe his name on a federal building, a lasting tribute to the service and leadership to the state of Massachusetts, to the House of Representatives, and his leadership for all Americans. <clears throat> I thank again Speaker Boehner for leading this bipartisan effort to remember the great Tip O'Neill together on the floor of the House where Tip once uh, wielded the Speaker's gavel with courage, dignity, and grace. And I thank you, Mr. Capuano, for uh, help joining on the committee to bring this uh, to the floor of the House. And you served in this, the same district that Tip O'Neill did. What an honor. I served in the office that he had. What an honor. It is fitting that the Tip O'Neill Jr. Federal Building will stand alongside the office building named for Tip's dear friend, colleague, and partner in public service, former president and House Minority Leader Gerald Ford, as the Speaker Boehner indicated. They'll be neighbors. Uh, indeed, reflecting on their long partnership, President Ford once said, Tip O'Neill is an outstanding political leader and patriot who always carried the torch for the Congress and the American people, carrying the torch. <clears throat>
The statement captured the essence of Tip's success, his extraordinary leadership, his unflinching patriotism, his belief in the common good, his devotion to the unending fight for a more perfect union. Yes, Mr. President Ford, Tip carried this torch for all who believe that the purpose of politics is to improve the lives of others. Tip carried the torch for the underdog, for the person on the street, for the family struggling to pay the bills. He carried the torch of opportunity and equality into every budget negotiation, every legislative battle, every bipartisan agreement. Tip carried the personal, was the personal manifestation of the American dream, and he carried the torch for everyone else who strived to achieve it. For Tip, standing on principle was not about political gain. It was about fighting for the voices, the voiceless, and for the aspirations of the middle class. For Tip, the effort to reform and save Social Security was not about figures on a page. It was about the seniors fighting to make ends meet. And that's why we were so proud of what he did with President Reagan to prolong the life of Social Security. For Tip, floor debates were not about abstract numbers. They were about people and the consequences of the policy to their lives. Those were the values that enabled Tip O'Neill to leave his giant footprint, giant footprint on the course of American history. This is the spirit that made him a legend, that allowed him to help the middle class thrive, that ensured his actions would strengthen the character of our country in his time and for future generations. By his leadership and his patriotism, Tip O'Neill was a proud champion of his district his state, and our nation. With his gavel in hand, he was a giant in the Congress. With his record of progress, he was a bona fide American hero. By adding his name to a federal building, in sight of the Capitol he loved, we all carry the torch of the legacy of Tip O'Neill. I hope that we have not the close vote that would have been fun maybe at the time, but a unanimous vote. Uh, that shows that we share Tip's values and take pride in his leadership as he stands with as a neighbor uh, to President Gerald Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back the balance. Oh, no, I yield back to the gentleman. Gentle lady yields back, who seeks recognition. Gentlemen, can you do reserve? Reserve. Uh, I'd like to Gentlemen. recognize uh, the ranking member of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Nikki Joe Rahal, and yield to him two minutes. Chair, I can distinguish the gentleman from Massachusetts for yielding me the time and join uh, with uh, our Democratic leader and with the Speaker of the House in supporting the pending measure. Uh, Speaker Thomas P. O'Neill, otherwise known as TIP, was first elected to represent the 11th Congressional District of Massachusetts in 1952, and he continued to serve for 17 terms. During his 34 years in Congress, he served as the chair of the Select Committee on Campaign Expenditures, Majority Whip, Majority Leader, and finally, Speaker of the House. Speaker O'Neill holds a special place in my own congressional career because when I was sworn in at the beginning of my first term in Congress in 1977, it was also Tip's first year as Speaker of this body. He held that post for a decade, making him the second longest tenured Speaker in the history of the House of Representatives. Now, there are a litany of legislative accomplishments that could be described as defining the career of Thomas P. O'Neill. However, his most remarkable guidepost was his dedication to federal programs that address the needs of the poor, the middle class, the sick, the fallen, and our working men and women across this great country. Speaker O'Neill was an unabashed supporter of the New Deal and believed that government had the ability and the responsibility to provide for those in need, and he championed programs like public education, Social Security, unemployment insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, supplemental security income for low-income people with disabilities just to top the tip of the iceberg. Part of his success in protecting and growing these programs was Speaker O'Neill's talent in forging political consensus 
we've heard that described already, his superb political instincts, and being a pragmatic dealmaker, which allowed him to take on the day-to-day -day responsibilities of holding his caucus together while advancing his commitment to liberalism. We've heard the speaker reference Speaker O'Neill and his f popular saying that all politics is local. And believe you me, that was my first advice in coming to this body, and it's my advice to this very day that I've taken to heed. He, has over 50, he had over 50 years of combined public service to both the Massachusetts State House and our House of Representatives, a true public servant in every sense of the word. So because of this and his dedicated service, I'm sure that my colleagues will join in a bipartisan round of support for naming of this federal building after Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. I yield back my time to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Capiano. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. General from Massachusetts. I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. August. General lady from Massachusetts is recognized. I thank you. Uh, I thank my colleague, uh, Mr. Capuano, uh, for yielding to me. I rise today in strong support of H.R. 6604, which recognizes and honors the legacy of former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill had a long and distinguished career in public service, as we've heard. And this was clearly an O'Neill family value, as so many have carried on with such distinction. Tip, a friend and mentor to me and my late husband, Paul, when Paul served with him in the House, is often remembered for coining the phrase, all politics is local, as we in Massachusetts are so often reminded. His imprint has shaped the thriving Boston of today and protected the glories of Cape Cod for tomorrow. And we treasure his innate ability to bring together, with good humor and unwavering purpose, people from both sides of the aisle, a singular aspect to his legacy, which is most embodied in his work with President Reagan to strengthen Social Security, protecting this critically important program for decades. I thank Speaker Boehner and Leader Pelosi for introducing this legislation that will name a building in the shadow of this great capital after a great speaker, Tip O'Neill. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. General Lady yields back. Speaker, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield the two minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding and for his leadership. Uh, I know those of us in the Massachusetts delegation always welcome the opportunity to pay tribute to Tip O'Neill, a giant of this House and a legend in Massachusetts politics. For decades, Tip O'Neill represented the people of his district with distinction, hard work, and wit. And for, and for 10 years, he led this uh, House as Speaker. Tip got into politics for all the right reasons, to help people. As a New Deal Democrat, he believed that while government doesn't have all the answers, it can and should be a force for good. And while he may be best remembered for his admonition that all politics is local, and he always put his constituents first, he, always made a great mar he also made a great mark in national and inter international affairs. He fought to protect and preserve Social Security and the safety net. He worked for peace in Northern Ireland and against the war in Vietnam. And he was a great source of advice to me and so many others. When you're running for office, always ask for someone's vote and always say thank you. Never judge a beauty pageant or pick a raffle number because you'll make one person happy and hundreds of people mad. In his second term, Tip was appointed to the House Rules Committee. When he entered the Democratic leadership, my old boss and mentor, Joe Moakley, took that seat. And when Joe Moakley died, I was given the honor of taking his place on the Rules Committee. So I feel a strong personal responsibility to maintain Tip O'Neill's legacy. I want to thank the leadership for bringing this bill to the floor and for the effort to designate this uh, federal building in honor of Tip O'Neill. Finally, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to say this. Tip O'Neill believed that politics was an honorable, honorable profession. He believed that government should be there for the poor and the vulnerable and the elderly. And he believed in extending ladders of opportunity so that everyone, regardless of their background, could succeed. And I hope that all of us will remember the Congress and the White House as we enter these discussions on our budget. I hope we will remember Tip O'Neill's example. Tip O'Neill was a champion for all those who had no voice. We should be too. I yield back my time. Yields back. Continued reserve. 
gentleman from California reserves his time. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, the dean of our delegation, Mr. Markey. Chair recognizes Mr. Markey. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman so much for holding this uh, special session. Um, Mr. Speaker, I was elected to Congress 36 years ago. And uh, my first day in Congress, my first vote in Congress in January of 1977 was a vote for who would be the Speaker of the House. The Republicans were all going to vote for John Rhodes, a very good man. The Democrats were going to vote for Tip O'Neill. The tradition is that on that first vote, on that first day, that the member has to stand to actually say the name of the person for whom they are voting. So the first word I ever uttered on the floor of the House, standing at my chair, at the top of my voice, was just saying the one word, O'Neill. And with that, I had voted for Tip O'Neill to begin his term, first term, as Speaker of the House. He was a wage and hour Democrat. He was a Social Security Democrat, but he could work with Ronald Reagan to save Social Security. He was a man committed to ending the nuclear arms race, and he led that fight here on the House floor, but he did so while ensuring that there would be a complete preservation of the security of the United States of America. He always asked two questions on every issue out here on the House floor. Is it fair? And does it work? And he said that if it could not pass that two-part test, then it should not become a law in the United States of America. He passed a comprehensive energy plan off the floor of this House, protected Social Security, advanced so many other issues. In my opinion, Tip O'Neill was the Albert Einstein of politics. He knew what it took in order to make this institution work. He knew what it took to reach across the aisle, to find people of goodwill, to make this chamber work, and to advance the agenda for this country. So for me, it's a great honor to be here, because buildings as we name them also embody that person. And it is my hope that as people walk in and out of this building for the 21st century, that they think about who Tip O'Neill was. They think about Yes, how much he loved political war, but at the same time he brought his own personal warmth to that so that it was not separated here on the House floor. It is my hope that in naming this building, perhaps this process, this great institution can be animated by his great legacy. And uh, I yield back to balance my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California reserves his time. Mr. Speaker, reserves balance my time. General from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I apparently have no more speakers, but I'd just like to close up by thanking those members who spoke uh, on behalf of Mr. Neal, thanking very much the Speaker and the Minority Leader for bringing his bill to the floor, and congratulating the O'Neill family. I will tell you that I know most of the O'Neill family, and I will tell you that they are, Tip would be proud of them. He was proud of the ones that he knew and the, the ones he didn't know as well. I will tell you we'd be proud of them. Every one of them that I know is good, solid stock people who know what they're doing and know who they represent in their lives because they see me on a regular basis. And I want to thank them for being so tenacious in trying to remind us uh, that Tip O'Neill, who he was and what he was, and for living in his shadow and living the type of life that he would have been proud of. Uh, I would also like to just close out by simply saying, again, thank you for this Congress for providing not just me, but for all of us, the opportunity to come have these debates, have these discussions, have these fights. There's nothing wrong with a good fight over important issues. And to understand that each of us brings to this body exactly what Tip O'Neill brought to this body and what the people who will come after us will bring to this body, a commitment to this country, a commitment to their state, a commitment to their district and to the people they represent. Tip O'Neill epitomized it all. And that's why we're here today to say thank you to him, to recognize through him what this entire body stands for. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized.
Mr. Speaker, I support passage of this legislation and urge all of my colleagues to do the same, and I yield back the balance of my time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 6604? Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 6374 to designate the facility of the Department of Veterans Affairs located at 180 Martin Drive in Carrollton, Georgia as the Trinka Davis Veterans Village. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 6374, a bill to designate the facility of the Department of Veterans Affairs located at 180 Martin Drive in Carrollton, Georgia as the Trinka Davis Veterans Village. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, and the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Brown, each can, will control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I might consume. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, the legislation before us today does, in fact, name the VA community-based outpatient clinic in Carrollton, Georgia, as the Trinka Davis Veterans Village. Trinka Davis was a Carroll County business leader who desired that her estate be used to provide support and assistance to veterans and their families. Following her death in 2008, the Trinka Davis Foundation contacted the Atlanta VA Medical Center and determined that there was a need for an outpatient clinic in uh, Carrollton, Georgia to better serve the 3,500 veterans in Northwest Georgia. As such, the foundation worked with local VA leaders to plan, design, and construct the clinic and in September presented the $17 million gift in kind to the VA. The 73,883 square foot clinic, which opened to veterans in September, provides primary, home-based, and mental health care, and a number of specialty services, including physical and occupational therapy. It encompasses a 42-bed community uh, living center that provides rehabilitation services and long-term care. Uh, as uh, she was not a veteran herself, but Ms. Davis's generous gift was already improving the lives and the health and the daily lives of Georgia's veterans and their families and will no doubt continue to do so for generations to come. It's only proper that the facility that she provided the funding for uh, bear her name as recognition of her outstanding service to the veterans of the state of Georgia. It's received the unanimous support of the Georgia delegation. Georgia's major veteran service organizations have uh, all supported it and also I'd like to to note that according to preliminary cost estimate provided by CBO, <clears throat> it represents a minimal cost of less than $500,000 to the federal government. This legislation is sponsored by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Phil Gingrey, and I want to thank Dr. Gingrey for his leadership in spearheading this provision and for his steadfast support of veterans, not only in the state of Georgia, but across this nation. So I want to urge all of my colleagues to join me in supporting H.R. 6374, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman in reserves, Chair recognized the gentlelady from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to offer my support of H.R. 6374, a bill to name a facility of the Department of Veterans Affairs in Carrington, Georgia, as the Tinka Davis Veterans Village. Car uh, Mrs. Davis served with great distinction as a businesswoman, but one of her greatest contributions to our nation can be seen in her commitment to the care and well-being that was worn the uniforms of our country. 
As a teenager, Ms. Davis paid a visit to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and was touched by the sacrifice of American service members. Her brother, Ponce Davis, Jr., then went on to serve in the United States Army. Later, after her successful career in the textile and rubber industry, Mrs. Davis continued her work helping wounded veterans and their families. And in 2004, she founded the Tinker Davis Foundation to honor their service veterans, particularly in the state of Georgia. I commend the foundation and the Atlanta VA for working closely together to build this facility, which will serve as a community living center and a medical office to provide primary care primary health care and other important services to over 3,000 veterans. While Ms. Davis is no longer with us, her long-standing commitments to our nation heroes live on and make her a perfect candidate for the naming of the Veterans Village in Carrington. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady reserves the balance of her time. Gentleman from Florida is recognized. Thanks again, Mr. Speaker. I want to now yield as much time as he might consume to the Sponsor of this piece of legislation, the gentleman from Georgia, uh, Dr. Gingrey. General uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 6374, a bill to designate the Department of Veterans Affairs facility in Carrollton, Georgia, as the Trinka Davis Veterans Village. Mr. Speaker, much of what I'm going to say has already been said by the distinguished Chairman of the Veterans Affairs Committee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Miller, uh, as well as the ranking member, the gentlewoman from uh, Florida, Ms. Brown. Uh, but I thank them for giving me the opportunity to, to repeat and maybe elaborate a bit because it, it deserves to be said. Catherine, better known as Trinka Davis, was a businesswoman from Carroll County who founded the Trinka Davis Foundation back in 2004, after realizing the struggles many servicemen and women faced upon return from both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, as been stated, though not a veteran herself, through her generosity, Ms. Davis performed an outstanding service for the veterans of Northwest Georgia. Mr. Speaker, Trinker made note of the reports of difficulties that many returning veterans and their respective families were facing loss of limbs, traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome, unemployment, and loss of their homes. Although she is no longer with us, her memory lives on. Trinka Davis left almost her entire estate, over $18 million, to this foundation, which has used it to construct a first-class health facility to aid our wounded warriors in their recovery and treatment. I've been there. I've seen it. I was there at the ribbon cutting ceremony just this past year. It's a beautiful facility in my district in Carrollton. Mr. Speaker, with a war in Afghanistan, a recent one in Iraq, and unrest around the globe, the United States has more than 196,000 active duty servicemen and women that put their lives on the line night and day to protect our families and our freedoms. These men and women accepted the call of duty, leaving behind their loved ones and life as they know it to protect the lives of us and so many others. When our soldiers return from battle, sometimes they don't get the support and the assistance that they deserve. Simply put, we owe them more. Just as they have answered the call to serve our country, we must answer the call to serve them. This is what Trinka Davis did and why I rise today, and I'm, I'm so honored uh, to be a part of the naming of this Carrollton uh, VA facility in her honor. Thanks to Trinka's generosity and the tireless dedication of her foundation, the new clinic was donated to the Department of Veterans Affairs just this past August. The door, doors were open for veterans to receive outpatient treatment on September the 24th, 2012. And in the coming months, the clinic will also include a 42-bed community living center. While providing a variety of services, including primary care, physical therapy, and outpatient mental health services, the facility will serve 3,000 veterans and will allow them to receive treatment closer to their homes. Mr. Speaker, I believe that like our veterans, Ms. Davis is indeed a hero. She recognized the needs of her veterans and she worked tirelessly to meet them. 
the Trinka Davis Foundation ensured that Ms. Davis's commitment to the veterans and to their families in the Carrollton community and beyond would be preserved through construction of this health facility. I ask my colleagues to join me in recognizing Trinka Davis's selfless actions by supporting H.R. 6374, and I yield back. Gentlelady, I continue to reserve the balance of my time. Gentlelady continues to reserve her time, gentlemen from Florida. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that will be the, the uh, only other speaker that we have, so we're prepared to close. I have no other request for time. I urge support for the House Bill 6374 and give back the balance of my time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules? Gentlemen from Florida. Now, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members would have five legislative days with which to revise and extend their remarks on H.R. 6374. And I thank you once again for uh, your willingness to yield time and encourage all my members to support this legislation and yield back the balance of our time. The gentleman yields back. Uh, without objection, the question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 6374? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The bill is passed. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Purpose does this gentleman from Arizona rise? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 5788. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 5788, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 103 Center Street West in Eatonville, Washington, as the National Park Ranger Margaret Anderson Post Office. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and to include extraneous ma uh, material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 5788, introduced by the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Reichert, would designate the facility of the United States Postal Service, located at 103 Center Street West in Eatonville, Washington, as the National Park Ranger Margaret Anderson Post Office. The bill is co-sponsored by the entire Washington State delegation and was favorably reported by the Committee on the Oversight Government Reform on June 27th. Mr. Speaker, why will we consider multiple bills this afternoon to designate postal facilities after fallen military heroes? H.R. 5788 gives us the opportunity to honor those who wear a different kind of uniform, our country's National Park Rangers. Specifically, this legislation would name the post office in Eatonville, Washington, for Margaret Anderson, a National Park Ranger who was shot and killed in the line of duty on New Year's Day in 2012. Ranger Anderson worked to keep the visitors of Mount Rainier safe, and on New Year's Day, she gave the ultimate sacrifice for the safety of others. For going above and beyond a park ranger's duty to protect and serve, I thank Ranger, ranger Anderson and all those who serve in our national parks for their service and dedication to our country. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to join me in su strong support of this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Chair recognizes Mr. Almar. 
Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. So ordered. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to join my colleagues in support of H.R. 5788, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service in Eatonville, Washington, as the National Park Ranger Margaret Anderson Post Office. In accordance with committee requirements, the bill is co-sponsored by all members of the Washington delegation. Margaret Anderson was born near Toronto and grew up in Connecticut and Westfield, New Jersey. She received her bachelor's degree in fisheries and wildlife sciences from Kansas State University in 1999 and her master's degree in biology from Fort Hayes State University in Kansas. She loved the outdoors and was said to be at peace in nature. Margaret Anderson was living her dream working with her husband Eric at Mount Rainier National Park as a United States Park Ranger. Her duties were not confined to patrolling but ranged from supervision of snowplow areas to medical coordination and instruction for her fellow staff members. Anderson was described by her colleagues as a candid and honest co-worker who could always bring a smile to your face. On New Year's Day, Anderson blocked the road with her patrol car to hinder the escape of a man who crashed through a checkpoint. Little did she know at that time that the man was a suspect in an earlier shooting that wounded four people. The suspect shot at her while she was still blocking the road with her patrol car and she was fatally wounded. Mr. Speaker, National Park Ranger Margaret Anderson made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. I urge passage of this bill to honor her on behalf of all of our colleagues in the House, especially the Washington dedication. And this uh, is dedicated, the passage of this bill is dedicated to her family and to the United States Park Service. I urge passage of H.R. 5788 and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would now like to yield as much time as he may consume to my distinguished colleague from the state of Washington, the sponsor of this legislation, Mr. Riker. Gentleman uh, Washington, Washington Drake, then. Thank the gentleman for uh, yielding. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I rise today uh, in support of H.R. 5788, legislation to designate the post office located at 103 Center Street West in Eatonville, Washington, as the National Park Ranger Margaret Anderson Post Office. Now, you've heard a little bit about some of her history or educational past and some of her family history, but uh, let me tell you that this really hits close to home for me as a law enforcement officer in my previous life. I spent 33 years in the law enforcement uh, profession. Margaret Anderson was a park ranger for four years at Mount Rainier National Park. Eatonville, the little town of Eatonville, is nestled in a little valley right at the bottom of beautiful Mount Rainier where Margaret Anderson lived. It's called the gateway to the National Park, the gateway to Mount Rainier, the gateway where folks come to, to visit, reflect on their lives and dream. It's a peaceful, serene, usually peaceful, serene and beautiful place to visit. Margaret's job usually was to guide folks, give direction, patrol the area, offer first aid, and just in general be the, the loving and kind person that she's been described uh, here today and uh, after her death and throughout the past year by friends and family who dearly miss her. But on New Year's Day, things changed. Her job took on a total different meaning. She was now the protector of those people who came to reflect and dream. Their lives were in danger. And she stepped in front. She parked her car, blocked this crazed man with a firearm. Many say that her actions saved many lives that day. But it didn't save hers. She died. She died protecting those she served. And I think it's only fitting because of that sacrifice and the service to that community and the love uh, that that community has had for Margaret and her husband Eric, who also served as a ranger, 
but has now moved on uh, because memories there are too hard for him to bear. It's only fitting that this small little town with this small little post office have the name of Margaret Anderson attached to that building in honor of her service and her sacrifice to that community. I urge my colleagues to support the passage of this bill and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Speaker, we have no further speakers on our side and I would yield back the balance of our time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I urge all members to support the passage of H.R. 5788 and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 5788? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does the gentleman of Arizona rise? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 5738. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 5738, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 15285 Samoan Drive in Macomb, Michigan as the Lance Corporal Anthony A. Delisio Clinton Macomb Carrier Annex. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier, will each control 20 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 5738, introduced by the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Miller, would designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 1528-5 Solman Drive in Macomb, Michigan, as the Lance Corporal Anthony a. DeCilio Clinton Macabre Carrier Annex. The bill is co-sponsored by the entire Michigan State delegation and was favorably reported by the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on September 20th. Mr. Speaker, it is altogether fitting and proper that we name this post office in Macomb, Michigan for Marine Corporal Lance Corporal De DeCilio, a selfless patriot who made the ultimate sacrifice in Afghanistan at just 20 years of age. Lance Corporal DeCilio was shot and killed by enemy fighters during patrol he had volunteered for. Mr. Speaker, Lance Corporal DeCilio and all of our brave and courageous fighting men and women are true heroes. And I am thankful to have this opportunity to stand before this chamber and express my sincere gratitude for all, their service, all that our service members do and all that they sacrifice each and every day. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to join me in strong support of this bill and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time, Mr. Altmar. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to join my colleagues in consideration of H.R. 5738, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service in Macomb, Michigan, as the Lance Corporal Anthony Delisio Clinton Macomb Carrier Annex. In accordance with committee requirements, the bill is co-sponsored by all members of the Michigan delegation. After graduating Dakota High School in Macomb Township, Anthony Delisio enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. After recruit training, he was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment, 2nd Marine Division, 2 Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He was deployed to Afghanistan in December 2009. While on patrol in the Helmand Province, Lance Corporal Delisio and two other Marines were attacked by enemy insurgents. Lance Corporal Delisio was fatally wounded in the ensuing gun battle, leaving behind his parents, a fiance, and a host of siblings and friends who all remember Anthony as a personable guy who always wanted to serve the people. When we rename this postal facility in his honor, generations to come will know of his heroism and sacrifice. Mr. Speaker, I urge passage of H.R. 5738 and reserve the balance of my time. General reserves his time. General from Arizona is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield as much time as she may consume to the, my distinguished colleague from the state of Wish, uh, Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Speaker, 
throughout the history of our great nation, American patriots have answered their nation's call to defend the freedom that we all hold dear. Lance Corporal Anthony Delisio was one such hero. Anthony Delisio grew up in Macomb Township, Michigan, which I'm very proud to represent. He was an all-American kid, was a member of the swim team and the baseball team at Dakota High School. And after graduating from high school in June of 2008, Anthony could have gone on to college or he could have gone to work in his family's small business, but he was determined, determined to serve the cause of freedom. Against the wishes of his family, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps in August of that year. Lance Corporal Delisio was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 6th Marine Regiment, 2nd Marine Division, 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force, based at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And he shipped out with his brother Marines to Afghanistan for combat operations in the Helmand Province in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. And on May 30 of 2010, Lance Corporal Delisio was told by his superiors that he could take the day off. But that wasn't Anthony. That night, Lance Corporal Delisio went on patrol with his Marine brothers when they were ambushed just outside the camp and a battle ensued. In that battle, Lance Corporal Delisio and two of his Marine brothers were killed in action in defense of our freedom just one month shy of their scheduled return, Mr. Speaker, from Afghanistan. Lance Corporal Anthony Delisio loved his country. He loved the Marine Corps and he fought with courage and honor and distinction to preserve our liberty. In this great nation, we honor our heroes like Lance Corporal Delisio. And while nothing that we can do will ever fully honor his incredibly brave service and his ultimate sacrifice in defense of freedom, we have a responsibility to do what we can. So I ask every member of this House to join me in honoring this American hero, this great American patriot, by supporting this legislation, which will designate the postal facility in Macomb Township, Michigan, as the Lance Corporal Anthony A. Delisio Clinton Macomb Carrier Annex. Anthony, Mr. Speaker, was loved by his family, his father, Lorenzo, his stepmother, Tina, his mother, Tamara, who sadly has just recently passed away, his brothers, Dino, Angelo, Joe, his sisters, Lisa and Marie. We also honor them for sharing this person who they love so much with all of us. And we cannot remove their sorrow for the loss of Anthony, but we can show them that the entire nation honors his service and his sacrifice. And of course, the motto of the United States Marine Corps is Semper Fidelis, always faithful, faithful to their duty, faithful to the cause of freedom and liberty, faithful to this great nation. Anthony was a true Marine, and he was always faithful. And again, I would ask every member of the body to join me in honoring this great American hero and patriot, and patriot Lance Corporal Anthony Delisio. I yield back my time. General, General Lady Lee yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Mr. Speaker, I would inquire of my friend from Arizona if he has any additional speakers. We do not. Mr. Speaker, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of time. The gentleman from Arizona. Mr. Speaker, I urge all members to support the passage of H.R. 5738, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 5738? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does the gentleman from Arizona seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I move that the House suspend the rules and pass H.R. 3892 as amended. Clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 3892, a bill to designate the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 8771 Auburn Folsom Road in Roseville, California, as the private first class Victor A. Du Post Office. Pursuant to the rule, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gozar, and the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Altmaier, will each control 20 minutes. Do you recognize the gentleman from Arizona? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself as much time as I may consume. I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill under consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 3892, introduced by the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, would designate the facility of the United States Postal Service, located at 8771 Auburn Folsom Road in Roseville, California, 
as the Lance Corporal Victor A. Du Post Office. The bill is co-sponsored by the entire California State Delegation and was favorably reported by the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on fe February 7th. Mr. Speaker, it is altogether fitting and proper that we name this post office in Roseville, California for Marine Corporal Lance Corporal Du, a true American who hero who gave his life courageously defending our freedom. Mr. Speaker, Lance Corporal Du and all of our brave and uh, courageous fighting men and women are true heroes. There is no way a grateful nation can adequately express our thanks for, to those who serve. However, naming this post office after Lance Corporal Du is a small but fitting gesture to the brave men and women who are the reason that this country is free. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to join me in strong support of this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves his time. Mr. Altmaier is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Sir. Mr. Speaker, I join my colleagues in urging passage of H.R. 3892 to rename the United States Post Office in Roseville, California, in honor of Lance Corporal Victor A. Dew. Corporal Dew seemed to always have a special place in his heart for the United States Marine Corps since he was a young boy growing up in Granite Bay, California. After enlisting with the Marines in 2009, Victor chose the infantry. He wanted to be on the front line, making a difference to protect his country. After completing recruiting training, he joined the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, Marine Expeditionary Force as an anti-tank assaultman. During his first tour of duty in Afghanistan while conducting combat operations in the Helmand Province on October 13, 2010, Lance Corporal Dew and three other Marines from his battalion were killed in action by an improvised explosive device. Lance Corporal Dew's loyal devotion to duty reflects great credit upon himself and was in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Marine Corps. He leaves behind his parents, his brother Kyle, his fiance, and a whole host of family and friends who continue to miss him dearly. Mr. Speaker, I urge passage of H.R. 3892 in honor of the service and sacrifice of Lance Corporal Victor A. Dew, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would now like to yield as much time as he may consume to my distinguished colleague from the state of California, the sponsor of this legislation, Mr. McClintock. I thank my friend for yielding. And Mr. Speaker, I never met Victor Dew but I feel that I've gotten to know him since the day that he came home to Granite Bay to be laid to rest in a hero's grave in the midst of his family, his friends and neighbors, his community, uh, and his comrades in arms. That day I discovered that his next door neighbor is a longtime acquaintance of mine. He'd watched this young man grow up and he was absolutely devastated. In his bitter sorrow, he represented the anguish of an entire community that had watched Victor do grow up to be an always good-natured, always helpful, always pleasant lad who everybody knew was destined to do great things. That same day, I met Victor Dew's younger brother, Kyle, and I think I got a fleeting glimpse of Vic in his little brother. Kyle was seated at a table with a group of his grade school friends. When I offered my condolences, one of his friends said, well, we came to cheer him up, and instead he's cheering us up. That day, I also met Victor Dew's parents, Patty and Tom Schumacher, whose intense pride in their son, fused with inexpressible sorrow into a transcendent dignity that I cannot put into words. Lincoln perhaps came closest in his famous letter to Mrs. Bixby when he wrote of laying so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. I've gotten to know Victor's parents in the more than two years since that costly sacrifice. I see them at the funerals of other fallen heroes, offering company to other bereaved families in a way I think that only those who've gone through such a loss can truly understand. I frankly cannot begin to understand what they've gone through and continue to go through every day. Whenever I try to imagine myself in their shoes, my mind recoils. I can only marvel at the strength that they summon. Time does not heal all wounds. For these Gold Star families, every day is Memorial Day, and every day their grief is just as real as when the casualty officer appeared at their threshold. At a Gold Star dinner several years ago, I confided to our hosts that I still didn't know 
what to say to these families. She smiled and said, well, just ask them about their sons. So let me tell you a little bit about what I know of Victor Dew. Everybody who knew him always began with the same thing. Vic was one of those sunny personalities who always lifted the spirits of everyone around them. They'd be feeling down, and Victor would lift them up. I have no doubt Kyle got that quality from his older brother. Victor attended Granite Bay High School, where he played on the high school football team. His real passion, though, is martial arts, in which he ultimately achieved a double black belt uh, in jiu-jitsu. His jiu-jitsu teacher, Clint LeMay, I told the Los Angeles Times, when I met him, he was like a 30-year-old man walking around in a 13-year-old's body. He was wise beyond his years and knew how to deal with all kinds of people. In high school, he met a remarkable young lady by the name of Courtney Gold. They both went on to attend Sierra College, and that's when they began dating. Victor had great plans. He had uh, grown up dreaming of becoming a Marine. When he was 12 years old, he'd hung a Marine Corps flag over his bed. Every morning after that, he woke up under that flag and the proud words emblazoned on it, Semper Fidelis. He steeped himself in military history. He was fully aware of the mortal dangers he'd face, yet in the summer of 2009, he enthusiastically enlisted. When Courtney asked him why, he said, it's my dream. I feel like I need to do this. One of his comrades put it this way, Victor lived every day with the purpose like it was his last. He always had a joke to tell you or a way to make your day better. He'd have tough days and instead of being negative, he'd say, this is the kind of stuff I live for. Well, he had everything to live for. Before shipping out, he brought Courtney to one of his favorite places in the world, Disneyland, where he asked her to be his wife. They were to be married when he returned. In the Marines, he was offered a posting to a ceremonial position in the presidential detail right here in Washington, but he turned it down. He believed his duty and his destiny was to keep the fight away from our shores, away from his family and his country, and so he chose combat even when he'd been offered safe and honorable service at home. Instead of the prestigious presidential detail he'd been offered, Victor Dew chose to become one of the boys of 3-5, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. He deployed to combat duty to Afghanistan on September 25th of 2010. Less than three weeks later, on October 13th, Lance Corporal Victor Dew, age 20, died from his wounds after his column was ambushed and an explosive device destroyed his vehicle. Lost with him were three other fallen heroes. The next week, a black hearse with the Marine Corps emblem brought him home to Granite Bay and to a hallowed grave. Courtney had already bought her wedding dress in anticipation of a far happier homecoming. The day before Victor's funeral, she put it on. She had a wedding photographer take her portrait, and she placed that photo in Victor's casket. And then he was laid to rest with all of the honors we accord to our heroes, posthumous medals and a promotion, full military honors, a flag given to the grieving mother on behalf of a grateful nation. 777 days has passed since that awful day in Helmand Province. In those 777 days, Victor Dew might have come safely home. He would have married Courtney Gold, they might have started a family by now, and he'd be well embarked on a long and happy life and a promising career. As painful as it is to reflect on what might have been, it's important that we do so, because in that pain is the measure of how much these young men gave up and how much their families grieve for them. They won't grow old to enjoy the blessings of liberty they died to secure for our country and for a country half a world away. A few years ago, I had the honor to visit members of the 3rd United States Infantry Old Guard who tend the tomb of the unknown soldiers at Arlington Cemetery. Tourists will often watch them on warm spring days, meticulously dressed, painstakingly drilled, honoring the member, memory of these soldiers. But tourists don't often show up during hurricanes or in driving so snowstorms or at 2 a.m. in sleet and hail. But the old guard does. They commit two years of their lives to this service under the strictest of conditions. I asked a young sergeant, why? Why do you do this? And he said, sir, we want to demonstrate to our fellow Americans that we will never forget. Victor Dew will not be forgotten. His family will see to that. 
His friends and neighbors will see to that. His Marine brothers will see to that. And his country will see to that. Today, the United States House of Representatives considers legislation to name the post office in Victor Dew's hometown of Granite Bay in his honor as a temp simple token of that commitment. Now, all things mortal will pass. Someday this post office will be gone. Someday we will all be gone. But the selfless deeds and quiet patriotism of young men like Victor Dew are recorded not in plaques and buildings and monuments, but rather in the eternal and indestructible archives of time itself. They will not tarnish or fade. They will stand for the ages as testament to the value of liberty, the character of those who step forth to defend it, and as the most profound lesson of the true meaning of the words that Victor Dew awakened under from the time that he was 12 and that he now sleeps under for all eternity, Semper Fidelis. Yield back. Gentleman yields back.